been praying and singing and fellowshipping because of what we believe. We come to the Lord's house not with our beliefs as being an add-on, but the very center uh, of why we are here and why we love him and why we love one another. Would you please stand and join with me as we declare to one another and to the world what it is that we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the one holy and universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. things that most of us, probably all of us, at one time or another struggle with in our lives is, is the constant ordering of priorities in our lives, of all the things that we could do or say or, or spend money on, how do we prioritize those things that we have to make decisions on? Some things seem so very important to us at a point in time that they're worth our money and our time and our resources, and yet sometimes a, a few days or weeks or a year or so later, that, that uh, issue is not really important at all, though it seems so important at one time. And we try to balance our lives with our time, to use our time wisely, to use our financial resources wisely, to, to use our energy wisely as well. But as I said earlier, we don't always know that the choices that we make today will end up being the best choices that we could have made in making our decisions. And in fact, sometimes we do find out that those decisions that we made weren't the very best decisions that we could have made. They may have been good decisions, but they weren't the best decision we could have made. Jesus had to deal with these issues in his life, and especially, uh, as recorded for us in our text for today, in the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 12 through 35. Let's look at the text and see the choices that were being made in the city of Jerusalem that Jesus had to deal with. And our text says that after this, that is, after they had the turning of the wine, water into wine in Cana. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. They stayed for a few days. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove, up, drove all the drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. 
his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. This is the reading of God's holy word. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you for these words, this story that we have perhaps read and heard many times in our lives. Open it afresh and anew to us, not just to remind us of what Jesus did on that day, but what you'd have for us to do in our lives on this day. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, it was just a few days after the miracle, the miraculous sign that Jesus performed uh, in Cana, and Jesus went with his family up to Jerusalem at the time of the Passover, one of the three feasts that every man who was a Jew was expected uh, on that holiday to make a trip to Jerusalem to worship there. And when he got there, when he got to the Temple Mount, the top of the mount where the temple is located, a very large area, he saw what he saw and it was offensive to him. He was seeing that there were sacrifices being sold all over the uh, Temple Mount, all over the part of the Temple Mount called the Court of the Gentiles. And so there were cattle there and sheep and goats and chickens and, and, uh, and there were money changers sitting at tables changing money, all of them making a living on their commerce. And Jesus was outraged at what was going on there. After all, as you can imagine, up there on the Temple Mount, the holiest place in Jerusalem, with all of those hundreds of animals being sold for slaughter, the noise and the stench would have been phenomenal. This in God's house. And so he he drove out the animals with the whips and he overturned the tables of coins of the money changers. And he said to, the, to those who sold doves, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. Now, many people have read this text over the centuries and have drawn perhaps just a little bit erroneous of a conclusion here about what Jesus was really offended at because many would see these people up there doing business on the Temple Mount and would, and would say, well, they shouldn't be doing business on the Temple or in the Temple, certainly, and that they were offended that people were making money, making a profit, making a living uh, in the courts of the Most High. But that's not really at all what Jesus was angry about, as Lisa said so eloquently to the children a few moments ago. They were, after all, performing a much needed service, that people would come from great distances to come to Jerusalem, and they couldn't bring their sacrificial animals with them. They had to buy them in Jerusalem. Likewise, they had to pay the temple tax. And the temple tax was paid with a special coin, which was not available in their local towns. And so they had to change their money into the temple tax monies. And so they concluded that 
You know, Jesus was concerned about not that they were doing it. It was a good thing they were doing, but where they were doing it. For prior centuries, they had conducted this business over across the Kidron Valley on the Mount of Olives, but it was more convenient for the sellers and buyers alike to take it right up there to the Temple Mount such the animals could be taken right from the buyers' uh, state uh, uh, corrals right over to the priests to be sacrificed and to have the money changed right the, there as well. But of course, that was the problem. It was called the court of the Gentiles. It was the place that God had allocated for Gentiles to worship in. That is, there were people. There were people in those days because Jerusalem was, was at the junction of crossroads. It was a great me metropolitan city. People came who knew the God of the Jews, who were not Jews themselves, would come to the temple to worship the one true God. And God himself had ordained the court of the Gentiles for their, those non-Jewish believers. In fact, Isaiah quotes God in his book saying, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, not just for the Jewish nation, but for all nations that worship. God ordained worship was for the Jews, but it was for the Gentiles as well. That was God's plan for his temple mount. The Jews had all the rest of the temple area in which to worship, but the court of the Gentiles was reserved for the worship practiced by the Gentiles. Well, the Jews were so preoccupied with their business, with their business of selling sacrifice and changing money, they were so concerned about their business, they didn't have much concern for the Gentiles, and so they brought all that business up onto the Temple Mount. And they were therefore preoccupied with the business of the temple and were ignoring the purpose of the temple, that purpose being the worship of God. That was the essential for the temple. Everything else was ancillary, maybe even important, but secondary to it being the place that God had established where he would reside in the Holy of Holies and his followers would come and worship him there. It might surprise you to think about this, but, but that's how Satan sometimes work, works. Sometimes Satan tempts us to do good things. And you might say, well, how can that be? How could Satan tempt us to do good things? But you see, Satan is more than willing to tempt you or me to do something good if by doing that something good it precludes us from doing something better. Or indeed, if it prevents us from doing the very thing that God is calling us to do, but the temptation of something that's not the perfect, but is good, draws us away from the very best that God is calling us to. Sometimes we choose to do something that is good rather than that which in God's eyes is essential. So we know why Jesus drove the animals and the money changers out of the courtyards, but why was he so passionate? Why was he so angry and zealous? And we read in Psalm chapter 69, verse 9, where it says, speaking about the coming Messiah, zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus was consumed by zeal for the temple. Jesus was consumed with the zeal that the temple, the house of God, would be used for its essential purposes and for nothing less. That quote was applied, of course, to Jesus by those who began to know who he was. And so he had zeal for his father's house, for the temple. It was a place for worship and intimacy with God. So Jesus was, ascent, was zealous for the essential of worship and not zealous for the nice-to-have of the convenience of the sale of the sacrifices on the temple grounds. 
What does that tell us about our attitude towards the church? This is, after all, the, 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 uh, the offspring, if you will, of the temple and the synagogues. The, the church is now the place. If Jesus were here today physically, he would have zeal for this place because this is the house of God. What does it tell us about the church? What does it mean for us to have zeal for the church? I looked it up in Webster's Dictionary, and zeal says that it is eagerness and ardent interest in pursuit of something. Is that what you have? Do you have zeal for the church, eagerness and ardent interest in pursuit of something? You see, it's not just eagerness or interest. It's not just liking the fellowship or liking the building or liking the music or on those rare occasions liking the sermon but it is something much more than that it is zeal is an eagerness and ardent interest in pursuit of something and what are we pursuing we are pursuing genuine worship of our holy god and a growing intimacy with him such that we are in increasingly filled with his righteousness in Christ Jesus. Well, how can we demonstrate that kind of zeal? How can we sort of take our, our zeal temperature and know how we're doing? And there are, there are four ways. The first is in the worship itself. It's being in worship on Sunday mornings. It's being here on a regular basis, coming prepared to worship, not to sit down and we're already into uh, already into uh, the, the singing or the message before we're finally ready to worship, but coming in at the first moment, coming into the door, being prepared to worship the Lord and to love his children. Secondly, it's in our giving. Jesus spoke many times on giving and the heart attitude towards giving. He spoke about our love for money, and in essence, what he says is that how we use our money, how we use our resources in supporting the church is a measure of our zeal for the church of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, it's in our service. No church can survive without an active congregation doing all of the tasks and all of the jobs that need to be done in the church, and many of them are accomplished with great joy because we enjoy doing them. But some of them are just work, and yet they're the jobs that must be done the service that demonstrates our zeal for Christ's church. Do you have such a ministry? Do you know what it is? Perhaps God is speaking to you to say, if you want to look at your zealometer, you may have to look at how you're spending your time in serving and supporting the church in which God has called you. And fourth, the fourth measure is our outreach to others. You see, our zeal ultimately is our zeal for the Lord in his house, and as a consequence of his commands, our zeal for others, those who are lost, those who are hurting, those who have wandered from the faith and are, are perhaps not even struggling to get back, but we know that they need to come home. That's the goal of the church. That's what Jesus had zeal for, at the temple for worship and giving and service and outreach. All four go together. It gets back to the priorities that we have for our lives. Do we seek to do those things that seem important to us today or those things that are essential for us to do as children of the holy God? It's not the end of our text today, though it's almost the end of our message. After the cleansing of the, of the court of the Gentiles, the Jews spoke to Jesus because he had made quite a mess of things up there, and they wanted to know who he was. What, who, what caused him to do this? And they said, what, what sign can you show us to prove, you, to prove your authority to do all this? That is, if you can show us a miracle, we've heard you do miracles, if you can do a miracle, that would prove you have the authority to do this. If not, then what are you doing here? It's amazing they didn't uh, arrest him and, and beat him on the spot, but I suspect that there, there was some smidgen of faith even in these Jews then that they half expected him to do a miracle and reveal that he had the authority. But they wanted either the, 
miracle or they wanted him arrested. They were disappointed, it seems, on both cases because his only response was, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. And of course, verse 21 tells us that he was talking about his body, his body being the temple of God as ours is today, not the building they were standing around. And we know, we know now, so many years later, that Jesus did have the authority. He had all of the authority and to drive out the money changers and the animals from the temple courts. He had all the authority to have the zeal that he displayed for the temple. And likewise today, being sons and daughters of our holy God, we have, we have the authority to have zeal for our church. We have the responsibility to have zeal for our church. And indeed, we have the precious privilege of having zeal for our church. Let's not let any of us allow things that seem important or even good overtake those things in our lives that we know are essential in our worship of our holy God and in loving his church and his children. Would you pray with me? We do thank you again for this church, Lord. We know it's here today because many before us had zeal for this church and they built it up and they sustained it and they populated it and they made it a place of worship and a place that people came and ultimately we have come. Oh Lord, may our zeal be so manifest and so overflowing that a generation or two from now and lest Jesus comes back first, that a generation or two from now there will be a, a, an enormous church sitting on this hill speaking out to this community and to the entire world that Jesus Christ is Lord. We pray this in his name. Please take out your hymn book and turn to 390. Let's stand and sing, May the Mind of Christ, together. Oh, mm -hmm. 
my Savior live in me from day to day. May the love of Jesus fill me as the waters fill the sea. The good, the great, the perfect news is that if we pray this prayer, God is willing and faithful to answer us, and he will fill us with the love of Jesus at each and every one of us. So go into this world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Honor every person. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Share the gospel. Love and serve our Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.